Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 58 of the Chadcast. I am joined uh, once again. I know it's been it's been a little while since you were last on, but I am joined by, uh, I guess, now the biggest Flesh and Blood YouTuber, I do believe, at least in terms of subscribers, you are now, like, out of all the people that regularly cover it, you're the... You're the top one. So we're joined today with uh, Steven, a.k.a. DM Armada. You might have heard of him, uh, you know, maybe. But how are you doing today? I am well. I am doing well. Yeah, it's weird, but that is actually, I think, the case now. Um, I think we're sitting at like 19, almost and a half subscribers, mm -hmm. thousands. Not 19, like, subscribers and one half of a subscriber. That would be awful, horrifying if there was a half of a person subscribed. 19 and a half thousand subscribers, which is pretty awesome. Um, it kind of just exploded out of nowhere over the past few months, and uh, and we've kind of hit that pinnacle. So now I have a secret, a deep down desire that won't be much secret anymore to try and uh, outpace the actual Fab TCG YouTube channel. I, I race them. That's what I gotta do. I'll be, uh, I'll be honest, man. I think it's possible because I've noticed for any game, the the main channel, like the main company channel, never ends up usually being the biggest one. Eventually, people outpace it. It's, you know, the main channel is like you'll follow it, but not everybody's gonna watch the videos. They don't put stuff out all the time. It's not as consistent. So I think you'll beat them. I think yeah. you will. You you got. I don't know because they've been doing the uh, they've been doing the streams for like the major events on the channel and that i see i, I looked at it because i was watching the stream like crazy uh for the pro tour mm -hmm. and like they gained like a thousand subscribers over the course of two days so they popped off hard and i'm like ah that's a pretty tough uh, tough nut to crack but maybe we can get there i think it'd be kind of funny random guy in office gains uh more people pressing button uh, which would be kind of fun than the main company. Yeah, no, I think I think you can do it. Your channels, I've noticed, been growing really well. You've been making some really good stuff. Um, it's I think it definitely has helped that we're in a spot with the meta game where it's so interesting and engaging because it's such a varied meta. Every deck basically seems to be able to yeah. gain points in some way, shape, or form. And so just covering that sort of stuff, like it's been even for me, I've been watching all your videos because right now, and that's the the whole chat cast too, is like the state of the game. So there's kind of the mm. product side of things and like you know they're going to Japan, all that area and then there's the the metagame side of things which um i guess just to start do you feel that uh how do you feel about the state of the game currently do you think it's in a positive negative you know whereabouts uh, i think it's in a very positive place i think the state of the game if we're just looking at where the game could be and where the game is currently i think it's in a fantastic spot i mean if you're looking to play the game this is a fantastic time to do so um, you can play just about anybody out there and uh, you'd be pretty happy and pretty comfortable as long as you learn how the, the deck works, how the hero works. That's a good spot to be in if you're looking to try and pull in new players. It's expanding to uh, Japan. That's a huge market and they are clearly doing what I think needs to be done to um, maybe not lock in, but like really ingratiate themselves into that player base, which is a great, great thing. And, um, I mean, like, they're firing on all cylinders with regards to set releases with the previous set. This set looks like it's going to be good. Uh, that remains to be seen based on, you know, spoilers and how that all functions. But it's very reminiscent of, like, Uprising. And Uprising, I think, was a banger of a set. Uh, and so all of those things are kind of pointing to the, uh, the little needle going up on Flesh and Blood. And it was already uh, hitting five years this year, which is a huge milestone within the space. So it's definitely here to stay, and I think it's not just here to do its own thing, carving out a small niche mm -hmm. in the TCG space. I think it's pushing its advantage across uh, across a lot of the, the space in general. I, I couldn't agree more. I really feel like a hugely underrated thing. Like, it's talked about a lot, but I almost, even, even if it's talked about a lot, it still is, like, less than it should be. Where, going into Japan, I mean, I could imagine when, you know, the game came over to America, obviously some of it was the money aspect that really pushed Flesh and Blood high. Everybody was investing in the game. It was that whole, you know, TCG boom era. Yeah, but, yeah there was a huge increase in the players as well during that time because it was everywhere and it was starting to get in America, starting to spread, and it just kind of exploded. Obviously, a lot of those people left who weren't interested in the game, but it still brought on a ton of players. And so Japan picking up this game. They're fiends for card games. I can see this being another big boom in the uh, like global player base of F Flesh and Blood, which might not at this moment help your local game store, for instance, if you're over here in the West, but 
Like, I'm just going to be honest. I've noticed that anytime something seems to get big in Japan, there's a lot of things that just slowly kind of trickle back over to the West where people pick it up because it's popular over there. So if Flesh and Blood starts getting more influence, that will start affecting the rest of the world. And, I mean, the company themselves will make a lot more money and profit. They're clearly putting that money back into the company, into marketing. I mean, the the trailer for Mistvale was absolutely phenomenal, right? Like, they've they've done a really good job on the voice acting, on the animation's been getting better. It seems to be, you know, this one was longer than usual. So it's like there's more production time put into it. Um, and I think it's all genuine positive growth for the game. And I'm I'm really excited to see how well it does in Japan and to see how much that expands the global market as well. Because, uh, you know, English is a spoken language all over the world. So I think, you know, more Japanese people, you'll start seeing them show up at events over, you know, in Europe and in, in America mm-hmm. and that. Not in Canada. There's no events here in Canada. So yet. Yet. Well, but you never know. Hard in Montreal. Worlds next year could be in Canada. They just mentioned that it was in the Americas as part of that rotation. Uh, shout sure. out to the guy in uh, chat yesterday during our stream that mentioned that it was just the Americas. So they could go to South America too. Oh, uh, true. Yeah. Yeah. It might be better Worlds. there. Yeah, Canadians, Canadians can come down. It's a little, you know, although it's, I'll be fair, it's cheaper for Americans to come up. I'll just say that. Um, Cause your dollar mm. is worth a lot more than ours. So you guys will, you guys like a thousand dollars for you is actually $1,400 here, roughly 13 to 14. Right. So what if we all went to Brazil though? That'd be kind of fun. That would be real. I could see that happening. Cause I've heard that Brazil is really taking off with the game, um, especially cause they have such a big population too. Uh, so I think it's, it's very, and I mean, I know people like fluke and Hemel are real big driving factors to that. Cause it's, they're mm-hmm. able to sell the singles to those places in the world, um, which is actually weirdly enough, uh, a domain or an area of the world that flesh and blood starting to get into is really positive because these are places in the world that for instance, you know, I know we talk, people talk about this a lot, but like magic, the gathering has recently been pulling out of different countries and they've stopped printing right. their cards in other languages. So localization, that's just, yeah. It's just leaving a hole for flesh and blood to come in and be like, okay, we'll print it in your language or we'll bring it over. And there you go. Here's our game. Like, why would you not want to scoop up that market share? Uh, So I, I personally see flesh and blood growing. I, I genuinely wonder if we're on the cusp of like another big wave personally. Like it feels like it's the, the snowball starting to curve. Cause you'll notice that uh, in, in anything, whether it be games or YouTube, you and I both know this, where like you can kind of peter off a little bit for a while. You're like growing very, very slowly. Maybe you're going down and kind of just doing the little wave up. And the next thing you know, you hit like a couple videos or you get a set for the game or just, you hit that critical point where all of a sudden the growth just starts to go upwards. It's just like that big snowball. And I wonder if we're in yeah. another if we're flesh and blood's poised for that again. That's a really good question. That's something I hadn't thought about because I feel like as you enter year five, it really just kind of starts to do its thing, you know, mm-hmm. and just continue consistency and uh, moving forward that way. But it's a very, that's a very real possibility that we could be entering sort of another boon phase. I think we've, we've passed that point of like the, um, the, the boom of TCGs perhaps. Uh, where everyone kind of popped off the bubble. And I think we've passed that with the scalper thing as well. We've passed that. And now that you're in year five, you would think it would be just settle. But maybe, maybe uh, Flesh and Blood has uh, has what it takes to uh, pop off again. I think if I'm looking at, and this is something I've thought a lot about, and I probably should make a video about. If I'm looking at the landscape of the TCG market right now, there are a lot of new TCGs that are doing very well and are going to continue to do very well. You know, your Lorcanas your uh, Star Wars uh, Unlimiteds. And then I think the biggest one right now that is not one of the big three is One Piece. Mm-hmm. And One Piece is just absolutely popping off everywhere um, because of its IP, because of its uh, playability, because of its support from Bandai. And I think Flesh and Blood is maybe just sitting right behind uh, One Piece with regards to uh, its its own like sort of playability and, and uh, marketability. And maybe joining Japan and and uh, really ingratiating itself into that country is what it takes to kind of maybe even pass that one up and be the number four consistently forever. Yeah, I think I think something that is very interesting is most of the time when people talk about, um, you know, all these other games, they mentioned Lorcana, One Piece, how they're doing better than Fab or they're bigger than Fab in some areas or whatever, because they're backed by these huge IPs. There's, I guess, like a couple sure. things to it. The first is that I think everybody needs forgets about the fact that 
whenever a new game becomes the new hot thing, there's a bigger wave of immediate support for it. And then, I mean, they could grow, but I find that after a year or two, that might just start to come down because it's no longer the new hot thing to be a part of. Because there is a type of, like, player who wants to just be in the new cool game. They'll play it for a mm -hmm. while, maybe a year or so, and then they'll leave for something else or they move on with their life. Because um, Flesh and Blood saw that. We saw that huge wave of interest, and then it was it, it kind of came down. And I've noticed ever since that era... Every new game that comes out, like, I mean, you see it on Kickstarter, it gets a huge wave of support, and then most of them don't really do anything afterwards. So there's a few that have mm. broken through. I mean, Sorcery is doing its own thing, although it feels more of like a board game card game in that yeah. regards, because once a year. Um, but Lorcana, One Piece, I could see them continuing on unless the companies themselves decide to, you know, axe it, which when you're dealing with a big company, you know, big companies, that that definitely could happen, right? That's my 100%. issue with, with One Piece. But even if they exist, um, you know, people act like because these games are big that Flesh and Blood will never make it, but it's like Flesh and Blood is a very different game to those ones. The art style, the aesthetic, the appeal of it is very different. It's got its own niche interest that does overlap with the others, but like this is a high fantasy style of game with a bit of, you know, cyberpunk, steampunk thrown in there for flavor. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Hopefully pirates, you know, and necromancers at some time yep. too. Yeah, pirates right? exist. They do you know they exist exactly straight but up it's it the game appeals differently to these other games especially in terms of its mechanics one of the issue i've had with some games that come out um you know like i played grand archive very fun game but one of the the my qualms about it is it's like it still feels like it's just like a slightly better version of magic the gathering you're kind of playing the right. same game just with a slightly different you know more fixed resource system and so mm -hmm. it's like if that game starts to go down people would just go back to magic because it's a very similar experience whereas with flesh and sure. blood what other game is like flesh and blood yeah there's there's not uh one really on the market that does it in a similar way mm -hmm. there's some that like uh that can give you that same feeling if i'm playing as a specific character like a universes type mm -hmm. thing um that you can kind of dive into but the system is so far and away so unique compared to everything else that there isn't really anything that uh that can be easily compared to it yeah it's it's an interesting it's an interesting spot to anyone that says that, uh, you know, flesh and blood can't make it because, you know, a one piece is just going to you know vulture the audience or uh, Lorcana or even Star Wars Unlimited, which is doing very well in my local area. Uh, it's going to vulture that audience. I would say I think you're looking at it wrong because uh, flesh and blood has already made it. I mean, we're on set 13, um, which is crazy to think about. We're in year five and the game is like good and healthy and growing and selling and the company makes only it and is committed to making it and is not having to pander to uh, a board or investors or try and raise um, you know profits because uh, they're losing in other areas and so they have to balance that out they are just purely focused on the game and making it as good as it can be that's success period end of story like in just about every way you can break it down, that is success. So the game's already made it. At this point, it's just how far can it go? Yeah, Flesh and Blood's in a in a state, or LSS, I guess you'd say, is in a state with Flesh and Blood. That reminds me very much of like I've never played these games back when they came out, but I've watched like retrospective videos on them where like early Bethesda or uh, Blizzard before they were bought by Activision, where they were making World of Warcraft or the you know all of the Bethesda yeah. games, where these companies genuinely cared about what they made, so they made great things. Yeah. It wasn't you know, and they were profitable because they were great. Like I don't think anybody who's played Flesh and Blood can say that it's like a bad Bad game even if it's not your thing even if they don't like it um because that's fair some people aren't just they're just not yeah, gonna like the system, right? the system right yeah it just doesn't click with them that's fine right. but anybody that's played it i've or at least in my personal experience has always said like even if it's not their thing they're like this is a good game like this is a very high quality it's well made it's well designed mm -hmm. everything feels really fair um it's, unless you're you know getting cast bones twice by a ko on like turn one um you know but it, it's it, you mentioned um kind of the like like everything having value and cards selling and product selling, which is really good because a couple of years ago we were in a kind of opposite situation where everything was cheap. It was a big worry because stores couldn't make money. Uh, that was kind of a lot of 2023 uh, 20, unless you sold singles. But that's kind of something I've noticed too is, and have you noticed where, you know, when a hero gets popular, card prices lately, they just go nuts. Like when KO gets popular, all the brute cards just went through the roof, like from where they were before. So like with card prices getting expensive, uh, you know, or not like some of them are expensive. I mean, 
whatever's playable. But I have noticed it hasn't been as bad as it was when it was like you had like one or two top decks in the meta. And so it was like yeah. everybody's on those. Like when Lexi, all those cards were really expensive because it was like everybody was playing that one hero. KO's kind sure. of in that situation at the moment where a lot of people are playing him. But I mean, Hatchet Story just became a thing. And so like warrior cards are going up. But it does feel like you can pick up a deck for a reasonable price. There's a lot of extra options for cards. You don't just need the Command and Conquers. You don't always need the, the Tunic. They might be an upgrade to your deck, but you can get 95% of the way there, have something playable. Um, and I think that's in a really good spot. But, you know, seeing cards actually in demand is really, really nice because it does show that the player base is growing a lot. Because, you know, when, when it's a player's game, people don't really buy boxes. They might buy a couple, but then they just buy the cards they want for their deck because it's like, that's that's all you want to do. You just want to play the game. Um, but this kind of talk about, you know, uh, other options to tunics, you know, KO and all this kind of cards kind of leads me into a topic that I watched your video on it. Um, I know you guys talked about it on your give and take uh, show, which for everybody listening, obviously go check that out. It was a very good conversation, but we are getting a new armory deck and it's going to be KO. It comes with a new chess piece that looks decent it, it's like courage of blade hold where you can have one really big turn with it but you sacrifice the value throughout the course of a game like tunic gives you yep. um and yep. some people are very concerned about these blitz decks um so do you mind just i guess giving a quick rundown of your opinions on like new cards being in this product sure yeah i've uh waffled back and forth on this because i've really tried to weigh the uh the differences and like the the benefits and, and that sort of stuff um so they are printing unique cards to this product, meaning that uh, not just new players get to be you know, benefited by picking up this product that is a competitive out of the box in the armory level product, but it also gives something to uh, you know players that want something new for said hero. And it's kind of strange because you look at KO and KO is like a new hero already. So why would you need new stuff for the hero that's new but it's cool it, like in theory that every time they release one of these it's an opportunity for someone who's been enfranchised in that hero to gain something new uh, so this is how conceptually that is being delivered i think that's cool i think it makes the product itself feel a little bit more of an upgrade rather than just buy several staples because they're in the thing and then just run with it mm -hmm. um, i think the the biggest crux of everything with regards to this product and the the nerves that surround it kind of center not so much on the unique products but how available this will be to stores and to players mm -hmm. is this a product that will be so tightly allocated and printed and distributed that new players only get one shot to get their hands on it and they're going to have to be battling against enfranchised grinders who want to take ko and these new tools to a you know, a pro tour or worlds or a battle hardened even, um, because if that's the case, then the product is not doing what it's designed to do. Hopefully um, the design was to deliver an entry level product to an entry level player, whether or not they're brand new or they're just looking to sort of level up their armory game. That's what the product seems to be about. And I think the crux is whether or not, um, there will be enough product on the market to actually satiate the new player demand. At the same time, I don't have an issue with them printing unique cards. I think it's a fun vehicle for something new to uh, kind of enter the game. I have no issue with that. I, and I also appreciate that this is a product that, because these new cards exist, will not just languish on a store shelf. It will not soak up uh, shelf space in a an LGS where shelf space is at a premium and product that you purchase from an LGS perspective, you really need to move so that you can put that money into another product so that you can move that and so, and so on and so forth. So to me, this doesn't feel like a product that's going to sit on the shelves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where LSS wants to live now is we want to make sure that an LGS understands that when they pick up uh, flesh and blood, they can rest assured that the product is going to move and that players are going to play. Because if you're an LGS, there are those two things that you want. Product to move so that your money is recouped and maybe you make a little bit on the side. And then people come into your store consistently. Because if they're coming into your store, then you're selling them on all the other things like the snacks and the random packs and that sort of stuff. And that is what I think LGSs want is people in the store and product to move. And if LSS 
is targeting that for their primary uh, audience, which is local game stores and not big box stores like Target or um, uh, Walmarts or whatever else you're possibly seeing Pokemon in or places like that. I saw Pokemon, by the way, in Academy Sports Goods. You can buy Pokemon packs in Academy. That's crazy. LSS is not about that. If they're targeting the LGS as their primary vehicle, like they have been this whole time, this is a product that's designed to move. And that is, I think, a good thing. Yeah, my honest my honest hopes with this. So I guess to, to first start on the, the, the new cards, I'm in the same boat where I think new cards in a product like this is actually really good. I, I genuinely think if they just put like bark bone strapping and like beaten trackers, just all the old equipment and had like only new commons that nobody cared about, people would turn around and complain about the product being basically worthless. So like, why would anybody buy this, right? Like, it's just like, you can just, give out a player all the cards so i feel like people would complain either way whether they're new cards or not but i think including powerful majestic equipment that is kind of uh, like not not even like an necessarily an improvement on tunic but it's like a side piece to tunic it's like yes. if you're running you're playing warrior you might run grains but some decks might want the the courage in their sideboard for a specific strategy or right. you play the grains and tunic in your sideboard so you've got both yep. options right and so I think that I think this is perfectly fine. Um, the the you really nailed it down though. Where the the core thing with this is is there going to be enough to because you have to you have to be able to appease the current demand of of established players and you want extra for new players. But it's a very difficult you know uh, thing to figure out because you don't know you they've got the projections projections for how many new players they've been getting like a signing on online. Maybe they have store right. data to show like okay new players and and so they can you know kind of determine the the growth rate but you're never going to be perfect and you know my genuine hope is that a store gets maybe a case if they're a big store maybe they get a couple and all the established players who want the product can pick it up and there's still you know maybe uh two or two or three for a small store that doesn't get too many new players and maybe like four or five or six for the for the bigger stores in a bigger city left over mm. uh and they maybe you know every every week they maybe sell another one until they're out um you know, I don't know how the numbers mm. would work, but it's like I want the product to be able to be bought up by the people who want it. And the store still has some extra where it's the perfect amount for the trickle and do players that will last them until right. the next deck comes out. Because they're going to be released more of these every I think it's what every two months or so. There's like a new one. Yeah. To come out. May and then August and then October. Yeah. Because I don't just think it's the grinders who want this. I think even just people who only play at armories, but if they play Brute, they're by it. Uh, somebody like myself, I'm not going to lie. I, I wouldn't mind to pick up one of these to just sleeve up and have and, and yep. play just on its own. And I wouldn't mind getting one to keep sealed because I think it'd be cool to have a sealed collection of all the old decks. But I'm only going to do that if... I'm not buying a store out if they have more than yeah. enough. So it's like if there's very yeah. little and they're they're hard to get, I'm not gonna do that. But I'm my mm. my honest opinion is that there's gonna be enough of these. I think people saw the limited run and they're like, oh my god, this is this is the worst. But it's like, but if the limited run is like a hundred thousand, we're probably fine. You know, there's probably gonna be enough for for everybody. Um, and it's one of the things that I've seen that I'm not a huge fan of is it also feels like people are ascribing almost like a, a morality to it. I've definitely seen the opinion that like if you're an established mm -hmm. player, do not buy this. It's only for new players. You're, you know, and then there's the underlying insinuation that you're a bad person if you buy these. And it's like, again, yeah. if you go into a store and they only have five and like, I'll buy four of those. Yeah, you're you're just an asshole like at that point, right? <laughs> like that's, that's But like if you're an established player, it's just weird because I've never seen in a game before the community like in any card game. I've never seen it where a product comes out and the community is telling everyone else not to buy the product like that's a very weird thing for me to hear um i think it's fair to say hey if a store only has like one new one and you've already got one like don't buy them out of their last one um but the idea that nobody should buy it if they're established is very strange to me because i have seen that opinion. Right. um it's like they made this very clearly where like people are going to want it. They, they It doesn't make sense why they wouldn't make a desirable product. It, it's like, it reminds me a bit of uh, Magic the Gathering's event decks, but with new cards. So it's like a mix of also Yu-Gi-Oh! structure decks where those you would buy like three of them, mash them together and you have a playable deck. This is you buy one of them and you've got a playable deck. Um, and I think that's, I don't know. I, I just, it's a product that I really hope has enough because as long as there's enough, all the worries and woes are just, they're, they're nothing. They're not going to be an issue. Um, mm. Cause you, you also like, you said you don't want stores to wind up with like 15 of these sitting on the shelf and not being able to sell it all because you know eventually the heroes living legend as well so you don't want stores mm -hmm. sticking with them for too long because then it's literally a dead product once the hero living legends yep. so they have unless to be... you're 
unless you're picking it up to play specifically in li- living legend format, which is going to become bigger and bigger the more heroes rotate uh, because those heroes are going to go live somewhere. And uh, this is truly an eternal game in that respect. So I feel like they almost have to uh, encourage the living legend uh, tournaments to uh, kind of drum up the hype for that. But nevertheless, I'm curious to, to know your opinion because this is something that I didn't talk about with, um, you know, like the guys yesterday on the stream or uh, in that video. Do you think in this product there will be a play set of cast bones included? Probably not. It's a new card that just came out in the set. I, I think the Majestics reprinted are going to be older ones personally and make okay. some new ones. Okay. Just give me make... give me some give me some names then. What do you think? Um, I could see I could definitely see like a reckless swing. Maybe they have a couple few copies of that if they wanted to throw a super rare, which would now be a majestic. I could definitely see uh, I could see blood rush bellows. I think that's a really good card to put yeah. in because it's because yeah. the other thing too is it's a forty dollar product. So there's like there's no way they're putting in scab skin leathers for instance. It'll probably just be beaten trackers, which is like a good card if you've ever played that yeah. card. It's very solid. Um, yeah. and uh, yeah, I think blood rush bellow. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Like, uh, I'm tr- I'm blanking. I'm not a brute player, so I'm blanking a little bit on all the cards. Uh, like, what ones are majestics? But I I could see them making a new majestic because if you notice all of Chaos specializations, uh, they're all bad. It's like reckless charge and and I think uh, reckless swing or something like that. Like, it's all you know they're all about rolling dice and everything. So maybe this sure. one's got a new spec that that's a little bit better. Um, but yeah, I could I, I don't know. I don't I don't see them putting cast bones in it. Do you want them to put cast oh, bones see. in? I do. I definitely do. I think I I would wager that they put cast bones or a card like a majestic card like that from heavy hitters. So like a send packing, I could see them putting send packing in there. Um, if we're going old school crew, a beast within makes oh, perfect yeah. sense. Super solid pick. Um, but I, I do think that like if these are going to be competitive at the armory, armory level, it's not made of commons and rears. Uh, it is including things like uh, blood rush bellow and maybe one other power card. I don't think, and I think it, it technically, I think for this to be a really successful product, I think there have to be some other sort of chase cards besides the unique cards to it. Um, so there have to be something like a cast bones or a blood rush bellow to justify it being more value than $40 because why buy this? If you could put together basically the same thing for $40 or less, the convenience factor, but I feel like there's extra value added if you put in some of those staples and to make it competitive at the armory level, you kind of need those things, right? Yeah, I mean, I could see, oh, swing big. I think that's one I could see being printed. Swing big, that's if you think about, um, I feel like these decks is a perfect opportunity to reprint things like the uh, Blood Rush Bellow, uh, Beast Within you mentioned, and Swing Big, where it's like these yeah. older sets, because I'll just be honest, I don't see them releasing heavy hitters and then putting heavy hitters cards in a product that comes out a month or two later, because I think they still want, it's a somewhat new product. They're not going to want, heavy, if it's just the previous set, um, you know, release, they're not going to want players to not want to buy that product still their stores. That's yet. true. That's, that's a good point. So I can't see point. them personally lowering the value of cards from that set. But again, perfect opportunity because some of these brute cards, very expensive now. Like they're worth a lot of money. Like Swing Big, didn't it, didn't it jump after Pro Tour to like 80 bucks for a little while or something? I heard that it, it maybe oh Canadian. Uh, maybe it was like 60 American, 80 Canadian. I don't know. I know I sold them when they were 40 bucks. Um, and I mean, think I mean, are, are boxes in America like of Everfest still selling for forty five bucks like they used to be? Because if that's the case, you'll mm-hmm. get rich off of opening those. Oh my goodness! No, I have no clue. Um, but yeah, it's I can see them just using it as a way to reprint older cards, which kind of brings up the the question though of like, will they ever do? Gen- I don't think they're going to see Command and Conquer in these things, but maybe they. I can't see them printing new generics either, actually, because then that does become the thing where everybody's going to buy the deck just to get the new generic if it's good. So you, right. you've got to be careful with that. But I definitely see probably a KO specialization that's not a joke specialization that's actually good, uh, but not broken. And mm. uh, like, I hope this is, I almost hope this product does what, uh, like for the deck, what Outsiders did for Katsu, where it doesn't necessarily make the deck better. It just gives the deck more options to run. You know, like how mm. K- how Katsu and Outsiders kind of, he didn't get necessary. he got a little bit more powerful, but it was almost like a side grade in a way where it was like you've got different combo line options and there's different strengths right. and weaknesses to each. Whereas with KO, it's like maybe there's some new cards that just up the consistency a little bit more, offer him like maybe a slightly bigger power turn, um, maybe pairs with cast bones. Um, 
but mm-hmm. just I, I'm hoping it doesn't make. I mean, I know people have said that it's going to be the next Starvo, which I I believe you had even said is a little ridiculous to to suggest, but it does seem a little bit uh, difficult for it to become like a Starvo level mm-hmm. uh, power level. But uh, it depends on what's in this deck. I mean, maybe there's some really really good stuff that synergizes well with what it currently wants to do. But I like the idea of the product being a a different take on KO that is still competitive. Um, because then you can put some of those old school cards in there uh, without reprinting stuff that uh, is already accessible in heavy hitters, which mm-hmm. makes it good. Yeah, I just, good point. I, I just hope that I hope we see swing big in there because I've already sold mine, so I don't care and my beast within's. But it would be I really I checked. Do. It's twenty eight bucks right now. You can get one for twenty eight. Okay, they've got forty one. That's not too USD. Bad, yeah. Holy that's- crap! It did. Sp- it did spike up pretty heavy. I was going to say, that's what my friend said. So it was probably a Canadian price he was using. He probably saw people trying to sell it for about 80 because ours are cards are more expensive here. Yeesh. But yeah, it's I mean, it's it's a good deck. And I actually can we just talk about uh, just for a second of how good of a choice Ka- or uh, KO actually was for the first one of these. Like it's a more aggro deck, but it's not just pure aggro. It can also be mid rangey. Like you can have your big go off turns and you're putting a lot of damage on board, but you have the ability to block with a couple cards in the later game if you have to and do like a two card seven, you know, if you need to yeah. two card eight, if it's swing big, um, you've got the might token. So if you can keep those up, you can pump your attack. He's just a very not overly complex deck to play, but right. also, That's a big deal. also yeah. strong because you want, you need to, to pick it's like i if they made these decks back when uprising came out i believe the first one would have been five because it's a yeah. simple enough deck yeah, yeah, to play yeah, yeah. easy like aggro decks are very easy but i think as they make more of these i could see them being like here's the illusionist one now like here's the mm. you know here's now the the um i could definitely see assassin um after this set because it's a class that sure. after this set will get some more upgrades but i could definitely see them doing decks where they can add upgrades to classes that haven't seen it before either like maybe we get a room blade for instance Maybe we get Arachne as the second one. That's actually an interesting point because um, we're going to get Assassin cards and these seem to be timed around the uh, next set release. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, we're going to get Artemis Veil in May. The next one comes out, what, August? Is that right? Uh, The next set? No, 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 um, sorry. This one comes out in May, and then um, Part of the Mist Veil comes out in May, and then the next one of these products comes out in August, I think. It's either uh, July or August. So uh, the next uh, Armory deck could be tied nicely to a newish product that's been put on the shelves uh, in being an Assassin. And then the last one comes out in October, which is around the time of Worlds, right, I believe, right after we get our third set of the year. Mm-hmm. May, June, July, yeah, August. So, so the third set would release August, September, something like that. Yeah, I got the product page here. Um, so part of the misfail is at the end of May, the 31st, which is a very mm-hmm. long time away. I want them to, you know, give us the set now. Um, yeah, so the KO deck comes out May 3rd. So it's about about, about a month, you know, three week, three and a half weeks before part of the misfail, which I think is fine because it kind of leads after heavy hitters. And this is yeah. also why I think that they're not going to reprint cards from heavy hitters because it's like buy this deck. And then if you want to upgrade it, you can buy the heavy hitters packs. You can go buy a few yeah. packs and you, you're good to go. Um, Armory Deck 2 comes in July of 2024, so it's going to be the middle of the month. Then the, And the First Strike decks come out in August, so I think that's why you, you thought August. Um, Got it, July. I see the First Strike decks basically being like I Will Welcome decks, basically. Like, this, the name First Strike, it's like a very... like This is the first time you're playing the game you buy this little product it's probably gonna be very cheap you know and you just play the game um and then yeah the booster set come next set comes out in september of this year um so we're gonna get two armory decks in, in between the next like before the next two sets so we'll see i imagine july Wait, when does the when does the third when does the third um armory deck come out this year uh i'm not sure it doesn't actually have it in the product releases but i do believe i don't have their their timeline but i think it was like I think it was maybe it would make sense for it to be October. Yeah. 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 So and that's what they're doing. It looks like they're releasing these like a month. After big the set. Set. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Big set. And then accompanying uh product after the, the product, the first, the, the set it, that it's kind of tied to mm-hmm. has done its thing. Big set armory deck, big set armory deck. That's a cool little cadence. I just had a funny thought while you were talking. Okay. I'm really excited to figure out about the first strike decks because I mm-hmm. think that's fantastic. And you mentioned it would be like, these are just going to be Iro welcome decks. And I thought to myself, okay, a year ago, a year ago, I had the idea about how to make a more interesting or more fun, uh, like format for starter decks, right? Like, so the construction of the Ira starter deck is a 30 card deck and they do three of yeah. 
Yeah, three ofs. And so I was like, okay, what if we did 30? You could pick any hero, commons and rares only, 30 card deck, three ofs across the board. That seems like a pretty solid like uh, starter set format. If these first strike decks are basically just that, I would be so freaking happy because I think that would be a really fun little uh, format to play in. Just jam out some first strike decks, throw them on the table, and and kind of go. That seems like it'd be a lot of fun. I'd yeah. be curious. Yeah, I, 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 all I know about these decks is that if these are first strike, LSS, I swear to God, do not put a code to the website or like a link to the website for the how to play. I really hope there is a just physical paper how to play booklet so they can have it right there. They don't have to go to the website. They don't have to watch a video or anything. And then they've got like the paper play mats that also have like the phases of a turn written on them. So everything is just in that product for players to sit down, set their phones aside, and they can just learn how to play the game through the product. Um, Cause like the Iowa welcome decks, they had that little fold out cardboard piece where it had it did. Phase, and it's like that's I've been asking yeah. for those. Like I, I personally, I think that was one of the biggest shortcomings of the classic battles decks as a new player product was the fact that you had a little paper lore book with on the back of it or whatever at the last page or at the front. It was one of the two. It just said, "Go to this website. Go to our website for the learn to play." And it's like I feel like it. This should have been a learn to play book with the a one page or two of lore, and then the lore took you to the website. Like go to this site, to, you know, this link to read the rest of the lore between the two heroes. Um, because I feel like for a new product like that, you want everything in that product, you know? Yeah, 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 um, That's exactly. my, my big thing. Um, another thing with product that's very interesting is the Part of the Mist Veil Blitz deck collection. So we're no longer mm -hmm. getting the single Blitz decks, and there's there's the positive and negative to this, obviously, where now they're going to be in a set of three. Uh, the price was, I think, I mean, they're going to sell probably for less Seven, than seven. $70. So the price is pretty high. I can imagine they'll sell for less yeah. than that, but you get the the beautiful, beautiful box. And it's much like the Bright Lights ones, which uh, the Round the Table Bright Lights one. Yeah. Um, and then you get the three decks and a playmat, which I believe the playmat, I'm going to assume, is the, the I think it's the Mysteria art, I think is what it said. I can't see. Yeah, it. it's it's like a Hanging Gardens. Playmat. Yeah, the Hanging Village rubber playmat. So yeah, I think yeah. that's the, I think that's the, 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 Round the table was the original metrics location art. So I think yeah. Mysteria is going to be the one I'm familiar with it. Cause I use it in my videos all the time. Um, Good one. but yeah, the, it, Oh, that's actually cool. The mist cloak gully storage box. Okay. Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. um, it's obviously designed for casual play. Now, if these have the same, you know, foil heroes and extended art cards, uh, you get the really nice play mat, a really beautiful box. I think the price will be worth it. Um, but it's very interesting that they're going this direction. Oh, I, I'm okay. I'm missing an important part. There's also three packs, which I think is a great inclusion. Yeah. You get the decks and you get packs to upgrade those decks. Uh, that's really good for a new uh, player product. This almost feels like a mix between the Blitz decks and a bundle, where it's like you get some packs, you get a storage box, but yeah. you get the decks. Now, for me, I think the big positive here is that's a really cool product to get everything with. Like the mat, the boxes are amazing. They're so sturdy and they're beautiful to look at. I love them. Um, you know, and then. Uh, you know, the mat's going to be really nice. You get all three decks, which is cool because it's only three. It's not like they're asking you to buy six. Um, so three of them. And and for me, like I collect the Blitz decks too, so it's good. Um, and the three packs is amazing. My only big thing with it is the fact that I collect them as to, well. They're yeah. just all sitting on my desk. Yeah, I got a bunch over there. My issue with it, though, is if you just want, like, especially for a new player product, I know we're getting the armory decks, but it's like if you're a new player and you just want one deck, you have to spend $70. You can't just spend $12, yes. $15 to get into the game with these. That's yeah. my big I had a story. comment on one of my channels or on one of my videos on the channel um, that said that exact thing. They were like, I'm really bummed. I'm a U.S. player, and I and I like um, the idea of one of these heroes, but I ha in order to play that hero... Uh, I have to buy the entire thing. And there is some drawback to that. I understand that. Um, at the same time, like if you're if you're a new player looking to pick up the game, I think maybe the first strike and the armory decks are where you'll be looking to going forward. And this is an opportunity for like a bundle, exactly as it said. It's it's less about, you know, like this entry product, and maybe they're moving away from it. Whether or not that's a good thing, I mean, we'll find out over time. I am a little worried that you can't just go and buy these, but I would like to know the data on how well these sell mm -hmm. because it stores to me feels like perhaps the sticking point for why you change a product into something that is like this. If you look at this and you're like, okay, it just looks like a deck of cards, 
maybe it's not um, flashy enough or maybe it's not enough value for someone to want to take it off the shelf and pick it up. Maybe that's why they're trying to you know do something new with this product. I also just think it's cool to try and iterate on a product and make something that people really enjoy and pop off on. And so I personally, as someone who exactly as you described it, would just buy and have a collection of these decks, I would buy that product immediately. I'm going to buy that product straight up because it gives you all three of the decks. It gives you a pretty cool play mat and a nice box and a couple packs. Um, for a new player, there's, I would say, a pretty decent contingent of people that would look at that and say, okay, I get three decks, I get a couple packs. Uh, it's it's less than the price of a booster box and the deck is pre-built. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. But if you're not looking to break the bank and go like a board game style $70 and instead you just wanted to get your feet wet, they hopefully will have other products that allow you to do that. But I will say this, they are also releasing these type of Blitz decks in Japan just singularly. So they're they're going to be doing the Part the Mist Veil Blitz decks um, just like this packaging. You can buy it like one of each. So uh, And they're going to be in Japanese uh, localized. So that's okay. pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause so I guess a couple things. Um, the first thing I will say about this product being more like a bundle, I like the product. If there's one thing I could ask for, it's either a, um, do a, a coin or like a dice that has like one, two, and three mm. of the, they should have done with the, the cheese symbols, like as a re- resource representation or a tunic counter, or just to, you know, like have your resource counter or spin downs. With the, the hero, maybe this yeah. one, they would all be, the, the 20 could be like a two and the chi symbol, right? Like a blue chi symbol and the dice could have been the color of that blue, maybe sparkly in that. And they I think that would mm-hmm. be cool where it's like you get the deck and a dice, a deck and a dice. Because I can't imagine if you mass produce spin downs or, or like an acrylic resource counter or something like that. Mm-hmm. They don't have to do metal, just do do acrylic, right? Like just do the cheap, let fab metal tokens be the guys who do the metal stuff, more desirable. But in this product, you give new players a little cool token or something to use. And yeah. I can't imagine... Even even if it's a 20 sided spin down, like I can't imagine they're going to cost a lot. If you make them in bulk, maybe like 50 cents a dice, 25, 50 cents a dice. That's kind of a lot though, actually. That well, like I, I, I mean, if you're making a lot of these product. True. But I mean, like if each box is only a dollar 50 more, but you're going to sell it for the price of like 70, $70 or whatever, like it might still kind of balance out and be all right. Even if they put like an extra dollar or two on each product, like it's 72 instead of 70. Um, mm-hmm. I think that'd be a nice little include, but it's, it's like for me, it's 99% of the way there. No product's ever going to be perfect because there is logistics around it. Um, I just personally want them to make specialty dice or like tokens or something. I think that's something the game's really missing is is like a product where you could buy and it's like, oh, I got this little counter or dice or something that's specific to the game. Yeah. 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 You just give us, give us a D20, give us this, and then put like a pack. What do you think? That's the Lorcana way. The Lorcana uh, starter decks, they have the deck. Uh, it's sitting over there. It's too far away. They have the deck. They have um, some punch tokens. They have a pack in there. And they have a rule, like a, I think a very simple, like a quick start look, book that folds, that folds out to a half play mat. Yeah. Um, and it's honestly, it's, it's very near perfect. I think that's a fantastic way to just put it out there. And then um, there are some products that will actually take the uh, the packaging that it all comes in a little box and then have it a little tab that makes it resealable. So if you uh, if you just do the tear tab and then you can pop it back in and it's like a little carrying case. That right there would be fire. That would be very cool. Or you could do like a dual deck system where you have both of these, right? Both mm-hmm. of these heroes that are going to battle from that set and you put them in the you put them in the product, you put two spin downs uh, you put two little foldable play mats, one about each hero, kind of detailing what they do. Um, I think that, yeah, there's there's definitely some stuff that you could do with that type of product that would be really fun and uh, mm-hmm. enjoyable. And maybe this is on that right track of giving us all three, let's just say there's three of them, right? All three decks in a product, and then you get a play mat with it, and uh, and you get a couple packs to kind of experiment, maybe one per person. And you're sitting down and maybe play a three-person UPF, which I don't recommend, but it's possible. And uh, then you could each open a pack as well. It's, yeah. There's there's some ways to like spin it. I certainly think so. 
Yeah, this is the type of product that, like, it's very good to start, but it's one that they could easily iterate on. They could add stuff, subtract stuff. Maybe they're like, oh, maybe we'll, um, if there's more decks, they, well, actually, that's the thing is, like, if they're going to do Blitz decks this way, are we going to be getting a set anytime soon with six heroes? Because I can't see them being like, buy this product for $100 for all six decks. It's like, I don't think you're going to sell yeah. them that easily. Because that's, like... You and I might be enough to go out and buy that box, but I feel like there's a lot of players who just, and especially newer players, they're like, I'm not no, spending yeah. the price of a box on six decks. Yeah, and I, only want I spent, I, I bought these for 10 bucks from my local game store, right? These are, they were, they were actually selling um, the, the six of them for like, um, like, I don't know, $55 or something like that uh, because a bunch of people were buying them. They're just buying the whole carton of all six of the decks. Yeah. Uh, and so they had like a little special deal. Like, all six decks, 60 bucks. That feels good, including a play mat in the box and maybe a spin down and some packs. Maybe you could justify the price of a booster box. So like 90 bucks. Yeah. I mean, I might, I might save yeah. it up for that. I do. Okay. Actually, here's my question. What do you, how do you feel about them including a mat in this product? Cause one of the things I've, I've realized as a fab player, when you're brand new, getting a mat's really, really cool. If you've played for like even six months, you're probably going to end up with yeah, like five yeah. different mats from different <laughs> things. I've got a whole I mean, drawer full of them. Yeah. So it's like, they're everywhere as an established player the mat's beautiful i'm probably just going to give it away to a new player at the lgs like when i see them that's what i did with the metrics one because it's like listen i can only play with one play mat at a time i have several that are my favorites and i have my, my absolute favorite is uh aegis archangel of protection um most oh god ones. that play mat's so it's good. my absolute favorite art in the game it beat out uh rom's already putra's illuminate you know that art is like my second no, that's that's good. Awesome. yeah so you know it's she also did cast bones actually she's the artist behind that and dyadic carapace so she's one of my favorite artists in the game but that that aegis is is just so gorgeous and so like to me i'm just gonna be real the playmat's useless like it's dead useless i don't want it like i but i'm okay with it being in there but it is a weird item to throw in a product like this especially when it's like you could just sell the playmats on their own but then that kind of defeats the armor right. and it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a it's i don't know it's it's very different with flesh and blood because i don't know any other game that only exclusively does 99 percent of their mats through events most other games sell mats with their art on it and they have mats from events whereas Fab yeah but mostly... I, here's my question for you though if if they go okay let's take this play mat and let's give this in a, a very you know easy kind of um sealable package that's like easy to hang on a shelf Mm -hmm. Does that benefit the LGS? I don't think it does. I think it's just going to sit there, right? Like okay. maybe someone looks at that and goes, okay, that's a beautiful play mat. I don't play flesh and blood, but I like that art. And let's be honest. There's a lot of that in flesh and blood of beautiful art and beautiful oh, yeah. play oh, yeah. mats made from that. So I could see someone just buying it because they like it. But if, if the goal, and I'm thinking about this more th now that we've talked about the armory decks uh, and I've talked about it with my friends, if the goal from like Legend Story Studios' perspective is to make the LGS successful because of Flesh and Blood or, you know, Flesh and Blood helps make the LGS um, run successfully, is that a product that one, people will buy and two, LGSs will be happy to stock? I don't know. But then again, I have... 2.5 million play mats. So I look at it and I'm like, uh, it better be a pretty one. Otherwise, like eh, it's probably better off in someone else's hands. Um, and or it has to be very special to me, right? Like mm -hmm. has to be a very memorable like play mat that I received from someone or uh, that has like some intrinsic value. But that's just where I sit. So I don't know. Maybe maybe the play mat um, is is more valued by uh, outside of flesh and blood players possibly yeah i can see a, a brand new player absolutely a playmat is a great way to start especially when it's a really good location one like anybody who likes mysteria is gonna love that playmat it's a gorgeous right. gorgeous art um but yeah it just it does feel it's it's that one item in the product that like personally if it was up to me i would rather cut you know 10 15 maybe 20 dollars off the product price maybe even 15 dollars if it meant no mat it's like hey i'll take a cheaper product with something that i don't really want anyways but not every product like the products can't be catered to every type of player right exactly so it's like they've clearly decided that and i think it is somewhat smart because the only flesh and blood mat that you could just straight up buy at a store is the original one and the brown mat, it's yeah. kind of iconic 
it's kind of ugly at the same time. Like, it's not nearly as nice as all the art mats, right? Like, obviously, it looks it looks okay. It's it's clean. But it's, like, in comparison to all the, the art mats. Like, why would anybody, you know, want to use right. that over the art mats? Um, so this is a way for them to sell those play mats in a type of product that's not just, like, selling the mat on its own. Because I agree with you. If they just sold the mat on its own, I don't think they would sell unless it's a really good art. Because there's just so much yeah. good flesh and blood art. They save all the best ones. Like, people like their hero mats or they like the specific cards that they can get from armories or other events um you know the the playmat playmat economy of flesh and blood is very interesting to me because it is so different um you know like because for the most part you can only get mats through events it kind of creates yep. almost like a, a market for them whereas like there's a lot of play mats for other games where yeah you could buy it for 25 bucks at the store but nine most of them just don't sell mm -hmm. yeah it is kind of interesting that we have our own game with our own mini economy in, in the side of playmats. And I think it's it's always been kind of cool actually. I, I liked it. And then I think the the playmat market kind of blew up, kind of imploded mm -hmm. after a certain point. Uh, I was talking to someone recently, uh, I won't mention who it was, but uh they were talking about how like bummed they were that the playmat market kind of tanked the way it did. Um, and they were like, it's not necessarily because of, of how many mar uh, how many playmats we have on the market. It's it's more because of like how it's been how playmats have been moving um, or how often they've been moving. Nevertheless, I just kind of found it interesting that like he had this entire conversation uh, about the playmat economy, <laughs> and I was like, holy crap, man! What a what an interesting game we live in that uh, you can straight up have like a secondary market for the playmats of the game. Cool way to uh, kind of. Uh, make your mark in the trading game space too, especially when you're predicated on having like incredible art. Like if your art is so good that you can support a play mat side, side secondary market. How cool is that? No, I think that's really, really cool. It also gives a little bit of value because sometimes, you know, you can either trade or there are people who sell the play mats. You know, you go to your armories, you win a yeah. play mat. It's like a $30 play mat. There might be somebody who wants it because they are limited, right? So it's like if the art's really desirable, some are, you know, like you got the Riptide play mat, probably not nearly as desirable as, let's say, the Kasai play mat. Actually, you know, no, at, my, at one of my armories recently, um, they were they were doing the random play mat giveaway at the end. And um, the one that they were giving away, the guy who won it was a fairly new player um, and he had just sold out on Riptide. He was like super into Riptide and they they were like raffling off the playmat and they didn't reveal um, what playmat they were giving. And he won the playmat and then they showed it and it was the one Riptide playmat they still had. Dude popped off and we were all so pumped for him because awesome. he had brought... He brought Riptide to a uh, Blitz Armory, and he was just jamming games, just like so into the Riptide thing, which was awesome. It was really, really That's cool. That's fantastic to see. Yeah, he, I think it's he fair left. To say. Mm, he left that armory feeling like he was the winner. Yeah, see, that's actually what we do at our armories a lot is like if if nobody really wants the play mat for the week or something like there's been sometimes the armies don't fire or whatever because our LGS is small and like people have been, you know, they yeah. we do it on Fridays. and There's like several people who have just they got a different job or their their hours changed and now they work Friday. Yeah. So it's like you lose people that way. Um, and so he's the, the store owner has a small stack of play mats like he always like whenever there's new players, though, if they're brand new, like it's their first time there, he'll just lay all the play mats like out and say, pick one out of the pile like you can just get a free play mat. I think that's yeah, a good way to get people in. Um, and then, yeah, now we got this this blitz kind of set to also bring people in that way. Yeah. So playmats, it, it's a very interesting aspect of Flesh and Blood. Like I said, I just give them away at this point. I have a bunch that I like to keep, though, and they, it just keeps growing because sometimes you get them and you're like, that's a really nice art. I want to keep that one so I can look at it later. Um, and then, like, it just sits in a drawer. I haven't looked at them forever because they're just... Yeah. I need to get yeah, them. I have a lot of those. I have a lot of those that kind of do that. But yeah. maybe I should... <laughs> This video would get like no views, but what a great video to look at every playmat that you have in your collection and to just like enjoy the art. That would be a video that would not get views, but would be really fun. to. You could do a, a live stream and just chat with an audience while you're going over the mat. OK, I'm writing that down on my I have a notepad on my phone of all my video ideas. Heck yeah, I mean. And I got a Chromebook right over here where I've got you know, all this other little pen and I can write stuff down reviewing fab play mats stream question mark nice you do what can. i do anytime you get an I, I get an idea i just have to write it down and then do you ever have it too where you've got like a, a huge list of video ideas and like 99 percent of them you're never even going to do it's just you're oh yeah down. no i'm definitely not looking at that list right now i don't know what you're talking about <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I got multiple lists all over the place. Um, you know, uh, that this is the this is the uh, this is the thing that like uh, we'll just give you a random stupid idea and then you run with it and then the video turns out really good and it can do some really cool stuff. Uh, you can get some really cool videos out there. That's how I did six sleeve video. Nice. I uh, this little list. Yeah, I recently tried something very different on my channel with going over the Pro Tour game, and it has severely underperformed. Um, just in I general. enjoyed it. I watched that. That was fun. I, I appreciate. It. I I thought it was a really good video. I think I needed to change the maybe the title or thumbnail. I've done it now, but I think maybe you know maybe it just wasn't as appealing. People might not have recognized it as my video because it looked very different from what I normally put out in terms of thumbnails. Um, so Did we'll it? See. Hopefully over the long term, because like I I was really excited about that one, and then it's like. I think like number eight out of 10 and the only ones below it are like the deck techs, the blitz upgrade. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and those are horribly performing videos. I actually, after doing two, I just stopped. Cause I'm like, okay, these are, I know they hurt. It's they hurt bad they, because cause it's not just the videos themselves. It's then, then you put out another video of your normal content and it performs worse yeah. than it did before. And it's like, I can't, yeah. I can't keep doing this. Cause it's like, I'm tanking my own views. And I noticed that directly after I put out a couple videos. So I was like, yeah. I went from getting like six, 7,000 views. These are getting like 2,500 to 3,000. It's like a significant cut. And I'm like, okay, I can't I gotta be more uh, up on the ball for that. Um, I was going to do some research because what I want to do is make um, a, how to play on every one of these blitz decks mm -hmm. from, from the inception of blitz decks so that it's like literal just a boom go to it six minute eight minute video this is how to play the deck move on with your life like and then have them all uh wheels like uh, uh spokes uh connecting one to the other right I, I think that's a really cool idea for a new player to be able to go bounce around there i i don't know how youtube will handle this but i want to put out like I don't know, six videos all in one day. And I don't care how the videos perform, but I wonder if I post just like a bunch of videos all at once, if it'll like destroy things or if it won't, I'd be curious to like look into research of it. But uh, yeah, man, 2K views for that greatest top deck in flesh and blood history. Ah, uh, boo. You got to get say, those numbers yeah. up. Yeah. It's um, yeah. If you guys are listening to this and you haven't watched it, go check it. I think it was a. I think I did a really good job on the video itself. Um, you know, and maybe hopefully it simmers for a while, picks up. If not, you know, sometimes it happens. I have other videos on my channel that did incredibly well, so I can't really complain too much. Um, but I guess I guess getting back onto the topic, kind of of the actual podcast here, I do want to briefly talk about. And I know you guys talked about this on your your little show uh, the other night, but. We are about to see one of the most polarizing heroes in the current metagame. Probably the most, I think, I think <clears throat> it's fair to say the most polarizing hero. Uh, leave the format. Dromai is at just four. Prism's points. leaving again? Prism's gone again? Hey, hey, listen, I got my Prism oh, no, down here. You, no, you be no. quiet. Don't, don't scare her. Um, hmm. so I, I want to play Prism for a while, okay? I thought Prism uh, was leaving again. You said it was the most polarizing. Oh, well, okay. I think Dromai right now. I don't think New Prism. <laughs> I think New Prism is... De I mean, Illusionist is just a polarizing. No, game. yeah. It's 100% it's yeah, Dromai. Yeah, Droma. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah she's yeah. about to leave. So are you looking forward? I know you play the hero. Are you looking forward to her leaving the format? No. What kind of question is that? Am I looking <laughs> forward to Dromai leaving the format? Not at all. No, I'm... I'm I'm heartbroken. I'm crushed. Look, here's the thing. I only like one hero in Classic Constructed. It's freaking Dromai. Like, I tolerate everybody else, and I will play Kano, but I'll be honest with you. I would much rather have Kano be functional without Aether Wildfire than with it, because to me, he's just a by-the-numbers combo deck that either wins or loses, mm -hmm. and that's not as exciting as it could be from a gameplay perspective, like a though I do very much enjoy like playing it. Um, I think it would be fine. I pine for the days when I could play Kano in Blitz because Kano in Blitz without Aether Wildfire was so much freaking fun. It was so much fun. It, that is not to say that you can't have that much fun with Kano in Classic Constructed, but because he is so reliant to actually like do anything via aether wildfire it becomes this sort of reductive process of just playing to that point and then seeing who wins at that point and i would far more enjoy it him in classic constructed if he had a better overall card pool and lost that card than anything else so for me like my number one most enjoyed hero in the format right now is dromai and i am very sad to see her go because uh, she is super cool, can be built in so many different ways, mm -hmm. can be functional in so many different ways, and is unfortunately gatekeeping a lot of heroes in the format right now. So 
it'll be nice for those heroes to be able to rise up. Prism. And I'll, yeah, Prism. And uh, I'll have Kasai at the ready when she finally rotates. Uh, I've been playing Kasai a good bit Not bad. since she came out. I, I have Kasai list. Um, I actually took the blade flurries out of it because I built the hatches to Cause I used to play hatches to before heavy hitters for a little bit, just as like a fun deck. And it's <laughs> actually like a good deck now. So it's kind of nice with all this agility yep. stuff is, I mean, goblet of blood yeah. wine is like my favorite card from that set. Hands down. I love that card so much. Um, it's funny cause I actually have a draw my deck in sleeves i got all my marvel dragons in it but it is missing mm -hmm. like the e-strikes i think the command and conquers because i took them out for other decks and i only yeah. ever got one tome of imperial flame because I, even though i like dromai a lot <clears throat> and i played a ton of her before dust till dawn like the moment that set came out i was like we have prism now i'm back on prism so when yeah, yeah, yeah. evo came out i was like eh, well and and to be fair another reason i didn't play dromai is because at my lgs it's a bit more casual and my even my one buddy like people don't like facing dromai and one thing that's a negative side of card games <clears throat> and i know this was a topic brian gottlieb talked about and there was like a the big reddit post about it is sometimes people just they'll get mad at you for playing your favorite hero like people will get very salty yeah. and you sit down like oh Oh, you're playing Dromai again. I hate this hero. And it's like, then they, it's it's fine to not like a deck, but I, I find it's kind of shitty when people make you feel bad about liking a hero. It's like, yeah. I'm not here. I'm not trying to make you guys miserable. I just like playing the deck. It's not like, I'm not the one who designed yeah. it to have a bad matchup for you. Like, I'm sorry that you're the Arachne player, but like, I want to yeah. play a deck I enjoy. Prism, a little bit more manageable. She's not nearly as, although, I mean, you have those big pop-off turns. She could be absolutely insane, which is what I love about her. Um, <clears throat> But people, so far at least, don't hate her as much as they hated Dromai when I played her. So, but it was also because I had my new favorite, my like Prism's my favorite. So I was able to go yeah, yeah, yeah. to Dromai. But yeah, I'm looking forward to her leaving. <clears throat> Two reasons. One, so I can buy Tome of Imperial Flames while they're cheaper. I can get my copies <laughs> when they're not as expensive. Um, and then also, I believe LSS has said Droma is a pretty important character, so she'll probably come back pretty soon with a new iteration. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I've already got all the Marvel Dragons, so I don't need to worry about picking them up. I've got everything. I just need to... Yep get the new hero maybe she'll be an armory deck who knows um i think that's a real that's a real uh possibility yeah, I, I think this armory yeah armory decks a really good way to um sort of reprint briar bring back oldham in new forms yeah. and and tap into you know these reprints of old like uh tales of aria cards or uh, uprising cards yeah i think it's a great way to uh, kind of leverage those returning heroes mm -hmm. and uh yeah i hope she's not gone for long because it is a beautiful thing to look at marvel dragons in your hand and those cold foils in your hand and i've been over the past week and i haven't talked about this to anybody yet but over the past week i've been like deep down just absolutely jonesing to just look at just a beautiful foiled out deck and i think i'm starting to feel that because it's my draw my deck is going to be going away soon. And so I won't be able to take out all the beautiful foils and like all the Marvel dragons and just draw a hand of like the alt art cold foil C and C with like these, uh, you know, like a Tomal tie and like, look at this hand and go, this hand is so bright that it blinds me slightly. When I look at it, like I'm, I miss that. And I don't know how to get that back in Wait, this some current meta. Ah, uh, yeah. She's, she's like magnitudes more expensive to foil out than uh, Dromai because you've got the, if if you play an aura build, you got Shimmers of Silver. Uh, you're going to need the $1,000 Arclight Sentinels if you want to foil, no. foil out all the, the foil auras. See, and foil, that's like, too bucks. much. It, yeah, that's too much. There's a bunch I don't have, but I have been, I'm, I'm the person where it's like, if I can't get the very expensive cold foils, I'm good with a rainbow foil. As long as it's shiny, I'm good yeah. with it. Like, yeah, 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 exactly, so like, exactly. My Prism deck, I think the only thing I'm missing, the only card that aren't foil are yellow and blue war tune heralds because for some reason when i bought a bunch of foils to fit oh and a foil tome of divinity and a soul shield those are like the only other two because the when i was buying a bunch of foils they didn't have them at the store that i was buying mm -hmm. from so and i for some reason i bought the red war tune heralds and forgot about the yellows and blues so i right. need to but like just some commons and then my deck will be foiled out including the equipment and everything so you know i uh i do agree i do understand what you mean like when i get that hand and i'm looking at like the figments and you know yeah. like these beautiful auras and then realizing I can't yeah. walk with anything. So yeah, I'll take the the 10 that you're sending at me, but at least my hand looks good, you know? At least it makes me feel really good about myself until while you, I yeah. lose the game. Until you realize you're sitting at the game store and you're like, 
I'm sitting here with like multiple thousand, like a few thousand dollars in this bag right now. And if somebody were to run off with this, I am. Oh like, yeah. Heck yeah. Like if you it, got yep. cold full CNCs in there, that's what, aren't they like 1300 a piece or a thousand a piece or so? Oh, I, I only opened one. So I have okay, the so. one alternate art CNC, but yes, my draw my deck is foiled out with all Marvel dragons. The uh, alt weapon. art rabbles. It's got the cold foil oh, yeah. equipment. It's got the Marvel so, uh, crown of dominion. Maybe. Yeah, probably closer to it's, like it's 20, there. 100, 3000. Yeah. And so like I have a foiled out, well, mostly foiled out um, uh, Kano deck, mm -hmm. which I still en I thoroughly enjoy playing Kano. I just every time I pick him up, I'm like, I wish I could play this like the other way. Um, and it's still fun to play, but it doesn't give me the same feeling because it's not enough marvels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of cold I, foils. Dude, how cool would it be if this if LSS started to make marvels of like I understand they're making marvels of things that are on the board so you can enjoy them and appreciate them for longer. But how cool would it be if they started making Marvel like specific attacks or like uh specializations or like spells for wizard? Like you have a fireball Heck spell yeah. and it's this big, beautiful, like just or <laughs> or they have the regular version and and then obviously like the marvels on the side where it's just this beautiful like ether wildfire instead of extended art being a marvel and it's like the whole art on the card, that would be you know, just something like that, I think would be really cool to add to the yeah, game. Very sorcery-esque, right? Yeah. You look at sorceries like um, curio cards and the back is literally just the art in cold foil. Yeah, yeah I'll take that. I'll yeah. take that. I think 100%. that would be, I think that would be really good. Um, you know, and with, it, it's very interesting because they could also do um, like what they did with Command and Conquer. Let's say MST, you know, maybe the fabled for this set because we have ninjas, like maybe we get a fabled uh, Art of War. You know, some really different art version yeah. or a CNC or so, or not CNC, um, E Strike. You know, um, that would be I really think, cool. I think that'd be a really cool card to see. Um, you know, they could do they can do a lot with this game, and I I like the fact that they're willing to step into different Marvel versions because like I I would love you know full art versions of cards even if they are just an attack and then they go to the grave like just give me Marvel cards just give me full yeah, art man. beautiful just Heck except yeah. except for legendary demi heroes uh when they're like seven hundred dollars a piece because my God those are you know a nightmare although I did pull a Leviah when it came out I didn't even know there was a Marvel I don't even have the normal Leviah Dude, I have I, never opened the normal Leviah I opened I, so much freaking Dust Till Dawn trying to get one of those serialized cards Dude, I'm not I wanted even, to get yeah. one I'm not even joking I bought a box after the set released at like the on the Saturday after it released release and i'm just opening it up and i i get the levi i'm like oh ah, cool like a, a marvel leviah i'm like i didn't know they had that in the set because it i don't think it had been officially or i just didn't see the spoiler i didn't think i, I don't think i watched man sand's video um yeah and then my buddy was like oh nice that's like a thousand dollars and i'm like what so, like i didn't even get the i didn't even get the rush from pulling it i was like oh that's cool but like i don't play the hero so i don't care and then finding out it's a thousand bucks so i ended up trading it to somebody for like a couple figments and like the i was gonna say you probably just moved you probably just moved it for a collector like you're here in canada i was like hey let me I know what you it. have for prism and i was like just give me prism stuff because i was like and i felt that's good a good play that, right yeah because i was like i'm, yeah, I'm this play. guy's getting value he's getting like a good deal for the card and i'm also getting stuff that i specifically want like out of the yep. set so it was it was perfect um but yeah i i how do you feel about 18 marvels in uh miss in part of the miss Vale? i don't know i don't know how to feel about it i'm i like the idea but yeah so here's the thing like dynasty had a ton of beautiful marvels like i love the dynasty marvels oh, yeah. honestly i i yesterday this is kind of funny i took out my folder um my dynasty folder which is right back there it's the purple one and i just flipped through it because the uh, when i was opening dynasty i opened a decent bit of it mm -hmm. and um i made sure to grab every foil that i could for that set so the entire set in that binder is foil uh, cards, like foil comments, foil rares, that sort of thing. And um, uh, whatever the Marvels that I opened, I put in there as well. And so that's like a pretty foiled out set with like Marvels and stuff. And I realized as I was flipping through it yesterday, I was like, I think this might actually be my favorite set in Flesh and Blood. Really? Just to look at and to like experience. Yeah, I mean, I think it's super underrated. Like that set is super underrated, and I think it's going to get better and better as time goes on. And it's like really, it's just a cool set. Like I like it better than Everfest. I and, okay, I prefer Everfest a lot to Dynasty personally, but I think Dynasty is going to be like Everfest, where like when Everfest came out, aside yeah. from Starbo, most of the stuff wasn't really played. There was a couple cards, but it was like Swarm and Gloomvale and Miraging Metamorph and Starbo right. itself, and that was like yeah, it, yeah. right? But over time. 
Everfest has been one of the most powerful sets we've seen in the game. Like it's got just like a lot of the cards are are really really good. It came with Swing yeah. League. Uh, what is it? The yeah. Teclo Pounder. Like there was a lot of great. Even Dude, no, that, that sets that sets cracked actually. No, yeah, it, it was yeah. always good. It was always good. It's just people were like, oh, these these cold foil uh, potions and trinkets. They just didn't good. like the potion slot. They, they, yeah. they didn't like the yeah. They didn't like the carnival slot. Yeah. And they didn't like potion. I have hundred. I thought it was cool. I thought the set was great, and the fact that they ha had like a bunch of extended art versions of other cards. Yes. I thought that was great. Um, but I mean, to me, I mean, you look at those Marvel weapons, like if you're going to make a Marvel something, Marvel equipment and weapons, let's do it. Punch my ticket. And then you give me like the one in 10,000 Marvel emperor, which I managed to open. And that felt nice. so freaking good. Um, yeah, you give me that type of set. How do you not just enjoy that as a, as a opening experience? I was at the store yesterday, the LGS yesterday, and I bought some dynasty packs off of them and I'm like, yeah, this is sets fire a little yeah, bit maybe too. i'll have to pick up some dynasty actually at the store tonight because i'm going to buy armory later i've been every time i'm there i usually buy some everfest because that's one of everfest is one of my favorite sets mm. i love opening that set um just because especially because there's so many good like i think a hugely underrated thing about packs is good commons and rares like when you pull yeah, yeah, like yeah. that's playable that's playable that's yeah, yeah. playable i'll set these aside Everfest, like, man that's the yeah, one even if even if you don't get a good majestic if you get like a red blade like a couple like a blade runner and i don't know um like a wild ride or something you get like a red wild mm -hmm. ride. it's like hey two cards i'll set those aside i'll toss the rest of the pack because most of it you know i got so much bulk already but it's like or give it to somebody but you know keep the playable stuff set them aside um that's why i think welcome to wraith and arcane were so good there was those good generic you you know, like yeah. for scene sink below pummels. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that's a huge, so like for MST, um, obviously we don't know about the, the Marvels, but um, I, so you had actually said dynasty is one of the nicest sets to look at. I think MST might become that we don't see much of the art, It'd but be. so far from what we've seen, I adore the art of this set. Oh my God. The, the water and the moon and all the, the blue for this set is so blue is mm. my favorite color. So I, I absolutely love everything to blue aesthetic blue and green are like my two favorites. Um, and so I, I have a feeling this is going to be the nicest set to look at. And I have a feeling, especially with all the marvels, I, I don't know. Mm. Do you think Enigma is going to be, um, uh, like a, a board state illusionist again? Oh yeah, I think so. I think, um, there's going to be, I think that is one of the hallmarks of illusionist in general is that it creates board states. We know there's going to be spectral shields in play. We can expect there to be maybe even a different art for spectral shield. What which if there's multiples cool. like three different um, arts? Yeah, we certainly could see maybe, like maybe a new crouching tiger Marvel, which actually in yeah. your, in your corner for dynasty crouching tiger. Dude, Dude I know I have three of the, three of the uh, cold foil um, Marvel ones. So three of them in the three in the box i i pulled the, two um i kept one in the second one i pulled uh there was a guy at my lgs he's like a casual player but he had just built a kitty katsu as he called it so i was like yeah. you know what dude i think it was like 20 bucks at the time i was like here just have it like just take the card i don't need a second copy i'm not playing the deck uh but i might i might play the new zen because i have all i am very excited about zen yeah i have all the tiger stuff from dynasty i think the only thing i don't have all the ninja stuff from was uh outsiders but that that was more katsu cards rather than like yeah, yeah. Cards. so i don't care See, that's that. another reason why i like dynasty because mm -hmm. dynasty had um like these disparate archetypes that you could possibly build into that didn't end up being like very good mm -hmm. but that's what i want from this game most from a playability New standpoint archetypes. I want archetypes to be available. So like if I sit down and I'm like up against Zen, maybe this is a combo Zen, like playing these combo lines. Maybe it's a, a, a crouching tiger Zen. Maybe it's, uh, you know, this control Zen or something like that. Like that's what I want. I want heroes to be able to access multiple archetypes. And I don't need every hero to do that. Um, yeah. Some heroes can just do the thing that they do very well. That's fine. But what Dynasty sort of hinted at or promised is that there are going to be heroes that can lean multiple ways. Axes. We see that now come Warriors to fruition. That, yeah. We see that now come to fruition. And that was pushed in, in uh, multiple sets, but Dynasty as well. Like, um, I believe there was some axe support in Dynasty, but there's certainly spill blood in, in Monarch with the hatchets that came out. You know, that, that sort of thing uh, gets alluded to. And then we finally see it kind of get paid off. That's why I'm so high maybe on Dynasty because I, I want it to get paid off. I, I agree. Dynasty, like even when you think about cards like uh, Looming Doom, where it's like that's there's something yeah. there with that card, right? Like they, they did the extended art. Like I thought it was going to be playable before. I think it's kind of playable. There's some decks that use it. Obviously, the OTK Viscerai does, um, mm -hmm. you know, and 
there's yeah like uh, the spectral shield um kind of archetype that they did in the ward archetype that they did in dynasty you know like everything was dealt with ward and uh making shields and if yeah. you had shields you get go again on this mm-hmm. attack spectral procession gets power equal to shields so i definitely yep. i definitely see them building archetypes and i think it's as somebody who used to play Yu Gi Oh, i think that's incredible i love when there's multiple ways to build a deck because mm-hmm. it gives you a lot more uh it gives you a lot more freedom to build that deck it gives you a lot more uh you know creativity into it plus if you like a hero and you don't want to spend as much, let's say you play Prism, maybe not the best example, but let's say like new Prism, you really want a player and the, uh, you know, you could play the Iris build or you can play the Lag build. And let's say Lag is very expensive because you need all the figment or you need all the angels, but they're not that bad, the figments. Mm. Uh, but you need, you know, uh, like the footsteps and all these other things. But let's say you play a build that's more aura built and you don't, you could play mage master boots instead. And you can play, you know, maybe instead of tunic, you play the celestial kimono or something for some ward effects or like you can build a different archetype of the deck that lets you play your hero, but potentially not spend as much money as like the main way to play it. So if you're a more mm-hmm. budget player, you still get to enjoy the deck, just like maybe the, the secondary archetype that's not as strong, but it's still like playable. Um, and sure. And then there's also the aspect of, like, you sit down across somebody in a competitive sense. If there's two archetypes that are both good, like you said, with uh, Zen, maybe there's the Tiger Aggro Zen, but then there's, like, a Fatigue Zen that's using, um, you know, combo cards and, and Flick Flax to, to block and overblock and just wants to fatigue you out with uh, Kadachis. And uh, mm-hmm. you sit down at a tournament or at an armory even, and you have no idea what one they're playing. And so you sit down, yep. and you're like, okay, let's do this. And next thing you know, you played for the wrong one. And it's like, oh, crap. You know, I'm not prepared to get fatigued. Yeah, and that's the I I guess that's the argument against that sort of thing is that from a high level yeah, I do too from a high level mm-hmm. player though they're like eh, the more archetypes the more heroes the more uh, variance there is the less comfortable I feel and then therefore the harder it is for me to feel prepared and the less incentivized I am to go out and do but at the same time like it's a card game man mm-hmm. there's always variance there's always I think the more fun that uh, most players can have should be the target yeah and not necessarily like the the most stable or the most uh readable meta you know what i mean like a meta that is three decks isn't necessarily the most fun to watch no i i fully agree i can understand why competitive players like smaller metas like i will say when let's say when uh kano was ripping up in the ProQuest season or no uh road to nat season I believe. Road to yeah. um one of the things that i could sympathize with is where when you have like kano's doing things and you have a hero like dromai it's like well you can't build your sideboard to deal with both decks because like right. if you're a polarized matchup into both of them like you're playing warrior and it's like oh god like they're both pretty bad matchups um it's i mean now that well actually that's a bad example because the hatchets to Rintia was actually poised well against both those decks um you know like you could easily i mean maximilian klein almost beat arthur trahey in the, the finals mm-hmm. there right like it was literally yep. if he didn't draw the sigil or if if uh when maximilian drew off the glint if he would have drawn a reaction the game was over right then and there right so um the deck can beat it but sometimes you'll you're in a wide meta and you're like okay there's all these decks to play if i run into this one and this one i'm dead because i built my sideboard to deal with a hero like draw yep. with all these poppers yeah. well they're useless against kano because there's no blue you know block six poppers um yep. and so it's like it, it, there is that argument but at the same time i think overwhelmingly it's more beneficial to the game as a whole because more people like you said will have fun with a wider meta because they have better chance to yep. win um they get to play their favorite deck and actually you know not just get crushed by the same meta decks over and over and over um yep. you know one deck formats like lexi and well two decks i guess it was like wasn't it lexi draw my beat lexi uh and then there was, I think, a Zuri up there with them as well. Because didn't she have a good matchup in a Dromai, I believe? Mm. No? Icelander was, uh, was the, it was like Icelander v. Dromai in a couple of different, like, uh, battle hardens leading up to oh, okay. uh, national season and, and the U.S. nationals. Um, but yeah, there were, there were basically just those three heroes that people were jockeying between uh, Lexi being the best hero and then Icelander being kind of right behind along with Dromai being a possible like third. So yeah, it's, it's uh, it was, it was only like a three dog race there for a bit. Yeah. I think, I think now with a lot of heroes being a lot more even there's going to, you're going to see a more wide meta, but I can still see, I can still see a meta where it's like, 
after a while, people will figure out what decks are actually good and what aren't. And it just takes some time to figure that out. Uh, with Heroes leaving, like Dromai, you know, it leaves a spot open. So there's more figuring out. Then MST comes out. So there will still be like, okay, now there's new heroes. Let's figure out this new meta because they're going to, people are going to play them. They're going to impact. I mean, depending on how Chi is made, I mean, I don't know if you read the, the abilities on these heroes. Like Zen is mm -hmm. like, just outwardly, he is the strongest out of the three, just on the surface of like, if Chi's easy to make, he's going to be absolutely insane. You know, pay three. Yep. get a tiger and just search the best card in your deck that you need right now um seems pretty strong um so i do think it'll be a while but i can still see people figuring out a meta and there being like five or six decks that you expect to see at the top you know like you go to an event probably not anticipating seeing a riptide you know um <laughs> mind you at the armory level you've got a player i've got a player that plays riptide so when i built like my kasai deck i actually um a card nobody's playing i put in burdens of the past into that deck yeah right because against riptide mm -hmm. i played a game without it and i was like okay he ended up beating me in the end because he flipped three traps when i was at three and just went trap 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 you're dead when i was yeah. when i was going like lethal at him um and if you play a burdens it's like i draw a card get the free swings on kasai uh because you have a billion traps in your graveyard and you can't play him now unless you have yep. specialization so it's like a really good way to beat him um and i guess that's like another spot that flesh and blood's in though with the sideboards where it feels like there are answers to every deck. Um, there are potential cards that like Oasis can really do good against Kano if you get a couple, but it's, it's the problem has been trying to build your deck to deal with all of your bad matchups is like almost impossible. Uh, yeah, because that's, you do have to, that's the open meta though. That's card games as well. But, uh, I would prefer this over a closed meta. I think mm -hmm. I would Rather prefer like you having to make conscious decisions and um, either being rewarded or punished for the conscious decisions yeah. rather than everyone just playing a basic stock standard deck list of three and then just kind of figuring and, it out from yeah, there. And all playing the mm. same list as well. You know? That's what I mean. Yeah, stock standard 60. You just run out the 60 and then you you ask somebody for the sideboard and then you just run with what they've yeah. built. And they're, but that's they're the kind of player yeah. that I am. I'm much more the player that enjoys like figuring it out and trying and learning and then failing and then trying again and iterating then I, I mean just picking up a deck and running with it and there's nothing wrong with that yeah. but i'm just not that i'm not the same type of player um that you know would do that compared to trying to mess around with stuff yeah i i'm kind of a mix where like i'll take somebody's deck and then i'll tweak it and iterate it to my own liking to my own play style right. as well yeah, yeah. That's the big thing yeah. is a huge thing about flesh and blood is play style you can take a deck doesn't mean you know how to play it and actually pilot it and what cards you want to pair up together. That's why people use like other yeah. people's sideboard guides as well. You don't just, you need yeah. like, it's not just here's the sideboard. It's okay. What cards do I take out and what do I put in for this sideboard? Because like it, that takes some time to figure out too. And I think that is, it's like, it's both an upside and downside to flush of blood as a game where it's like, it's such mm -hmm. a, it's, it's basically smash bros in a card game. It's choose your character. Yes. And now you're just fighting other ones and your move sets and the way that you play will change from hero to hero. The cards you want to run will change from hero to hero. And there is when it's, especially in a wide meta, there's a lot to learn because you have to learn how your deck plays into every other hero mm -hmm. and every other type of archetype that the heroes can play. Uh, but I think that's one of the, it's a downside because it's a lot at the start, but that's a big strength to flush of blood because I think when you want a game to last a long time there has to be depth to it if it's a shallow experience i think pokemon's card game fails from this like it's very appealing to kids but the reason the people playing yeah. it is such a small portion of that fan base is because like you play pokemon for a month and you and and you play like one or two decks and you've basically played the entire format like it's really everything's very shallow it's very same samey like you're doing the same thing with every deck like the win conditions might be different but the actual like steps to get to where you're going are basically the exact same deck to deck so it's like yep. it's a very you know it's fun for a little bit but then you get bored of it quickly whereas with flesh and blood it's harder to get bored because like such a deep game there's so much to it yeah, I agree. I think um, your an analogy of it being like uh, Smash Bros is is to me what I've always, well, not always, but over the past maybe two years, have thought that the game should strive to be is literally Super Smash Brothers in card form. Like, mm -hmm. yes, you can build a sideboard and it, it's still going to play like a TCG, but there should be a critical mass of heroes and there should be a critical mass of strategies that it, we eventually get to the point where it's just like, you got to pick what you think is best for you and run it out there and try to play it into every hero and gain skills, become a specialist on your hero. Mm -hmm. And then just, and that's your main. That's who you main in a fighting game. That's who you main. And you just play slightly differently. Can a card game ever truly get to that point 
flesh and blood, in my opinion, is definitely on its way. And I think that's that's where they should be sort of striving towards is how can we make a game that eventually just gets to the point where you can pick a hero and then build the deck to function as best it can into everyone and then be the better player from there. And that's kind of what I'm really excited to see if they can pull off going forward. But the, the game is successful and uh, it's going to continue to be successful. And it's it's successful for a lot of reasons. And I'm hoping that it gets to that point because what an exciting day it would be mm-hmm. to just sit down and look at like this huge matchup spread of all of these heroes, kind of what we see right now. Yeah. And have a bunch of heroes have a bunch of different successes. Well, especially living legend format where everything's going to be legal. Eventually that format is going to be just like, I can see a day where some random deck that no, like I could see a day weird. Like, okay. Maybe not riptide, but I'll use them as an example where like riptide just takes down a living legend format because the card game, the, the, the card pool is so expansive. Nobody's prepared yeah. for him, you know, and he's just like built is to deal with like maybe a prism, like to stop her for however he can and <laughs> has a good matchup and everything else. Nobody's prepared. And then the riptide specialist just comes in and sweeps the tournament because like nobody knows how to play against that character um and that's a good way to think of anytime i think about picking a deck i see the smash bros character selection screen because mm-hmm. it really is that pick your character pick the moves in your deck pick the 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 move yep. sets that you have and there you go you're in 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 the ground and some matchups are going to be advantageous some are going to be bad for you um i will kind of add on to this idea of them being like smash brothers because i agree with what you're saying here for competitive as the 1v1 but i also think so if they're going to follow like a, a fighting game type thing where there's all these characters, you could pick them and it's your skill versus their skill that matters the most. 1v1 is basically playing on like the battlefield map with just like the two platforms or three platforms. Yep. Then for casual play, I would love to see them for UPF or PV or whatever, especially for UPF, make an item deck that every turn somebody like either puts resource in or they just automatically draw a card off of this little deck. It's like playing Chase for Magic where it's, okay. it's Smash Brothers right? But flesh and blood with items. So you get these items that can like deal damage or maybe it's like a potion or something or like these things. Trinkets. That, that, Bring the yeah. trinkets back. Or just like have a, de- maybe I'll do that where it's like, there's a deck. We, there's like two of each or something. You shuffle it all up, you put it down and everybody draws it and they just like, they automatically get to play it for free at the start of their turn. So their turn doesn't like end. It just like automatically as they just like enters the field and it's like random items like in smash brothers where it's just completely randomized. It messes with the game state a little bit. Um, yeah. I think that's something they should do for UPF is like make a special side deck. That's got like abilities or some other things that every like randomly just messes with the, the, the way the game goes. If you really want to mm. lean into that cat, casual fun um because like it's like mario kart with you know while well, mario kart also yeah. has items but yeah like have that, that that'd be kind of randomness cool. yeah like really 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 make upf just like that wacky crazy format i agree with that i think yeah. that'd be a blast man. yeah and put pirates in it yes and pirates i mean honestly that's that's the thing too with something like upf like what a perfect product to do heroes or like classes that maybe they don't want to bring to the main game just yet but they do like a pirate deck maybe it's a an only upf or like blitz i guess but the whole point is like stealing items from the opponent's decks or something right it's like for each opponent you get to take an item or something like that so like one-on-one maybe it's not as strong but in multiplayer it's like really good because you get you get multiple things but maybe it's like six resources to do it so like one-on-one it's not really worth it that way it kind of keeps it into the upf format more but you know well i think it'd be cool if they brought a pirate i would i think they should buy bring a pirate in i think a pirate's like a slam dunk in the game why not answer why not yes five stuff let's bring back dragons let 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 the draw my opponent let's bring back her dragons for her and then throw them back at her be kind of cool that'd be kind of cool yeah yeah that would that would be but i think mm. i feel like okay so we've been going for yeah about half an hour an hour and a half um i feel like we covered mostly i think we kind of agree flesh and blood's in a pretty good spot would you would you agree with that yes i would agree with that i think it's in a fantastic spot i do as well i've noticed that it seems like the game is growing a little bit like you just notice with the everything well it's really it, it kind of sucks because there's a lot of things that the game it just everything looks really positive product like heavy hitters is a really good selling product we finally feels like we came out of that really low time of 2023 with all the sets being underpowered um you know that was kind of like last year was pretty rough uh, but unfortunately there is a sen- I, a feeling i get of like everybody's still kind of negative about the game as a whole just because of all the last year so it's like whenever lss announces a new product or something it feels like there's like some people are positive but there's a lot of other people that just immediately go to like the worst case scenario 
scenario, like with the Armory deck, it seems like the a lot of the perspective is that, well, they're not going to print enough of it. And it's like, well, everything that everybody's worried about hinges on that question of, is there enough of them or not? Yeah. Um, and it feels like some people just, they're not giving the benefit of the doubt anymore. Um, and I do hope that sentiment changes. I hope LSS gets like a few wins this year that just kind of reestablishes that firm confidence of like, okay, they know what they're doing. We're in a good spot. We're growing. Don't need to be upset about everything all the time. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think they're on the right track for it. I mean, look at heavy hitters. That was unequivocally a win a in their weeks. And I mean, it's like, it was the it was the set that they needed uh, to start this year off. And it's just been win to win to win, in my opinion. Uh, you have that. You have a fantastic, the best pro tour that's ever existed mm -hmm. in the game, and one of the best card game moments of all time, regardless of what card game you're talking about. In that finish, um, you have a set that is going to launch them into Japan. Um, you have new starter products. Uh, you have new step up products. Uh, you have a pirate set at the end of this year. Yeah. Crossing my fingers, it's going to happen. Um, all yeah, pirate. I mean, it's like the all mech set, but it's all pirate. Dude, Worlds is going to be in Osaka. I mean, this this is really poised to be their year and it's happening in year five i mean that is that's a milestone in and of itself so i mean uh, it, the game's in a great spot i think the other thing we all need to recognize too um most games that do last so many years like think about like weiss schwartz for instance like a flesh and blood is bigger and more global than weiss schwartz and that game is older than flesh and blood is like it's been around for yeah. longer most games don't even make it to year five most games don't even make it to no. year two or three um and not like because the thing that i always lean on i i think is insane when people are like oh flesh and blood's not going to make it it's not going to get anywhere it's like what game aside from the big three is printed in six languages give me one other tcg aside from magic you go and pokemon that dominate the market give me any that that even release and like the only other languages i can see is like maybe like japanese english maybe you know some other random language mm -hmm. but like most games are in english and japanese and that's it they don't get any other languages we've got six languages now for flesh and blood mm -hmm. so obvious that they're they're planning for a worldwide global long-term game and uh yep. i'm personally glad to be here i love i love being able to play this game it's been very interesting growing alongside it because you've been in since the start so you've been here yeah. um since the early days i got in a couple years in so not as early but i was i was early enough that i got to enjoy like it was before monarch so i got to enjoy the way the game felt before talents came in and you know the yeah. older metas when ira was like the 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 you know uh, the bane of blitz um and when dorinthia was actually one of the top meta decks and finally after like two years of being caught hot garbage she's finally you know back up there as an actual good deck just a very interesting build rather than dawn blade um but yeah it's it's been a really interesting time watching the game expand and grow and i love that Every time there's a new set or there's something new, their LSS is always innovating and they're always trying different things, which feels really good because it's like even even with like bat, like kind of eh sets, like I think, well, a lot of people liked Outsiders. I felt it was eh. Dust Till Dawn was kind of eh when it released. Bright Light yeah. fell flat as well because it was only mech, but they're always trying something new. Demi Heroes are yeah. really cool. Marvels are really cool. I mean, they made a mistake with the Marvels and Evo, so they gave us like the best ones and in, in, uh, uh, heavy hitters. Help. Uh, yeah little little story last night uh we opened up a box my buddy bought like 10 packs i bought six we each gave two packs uh to the two new players and then um uh, he opened up one of his packs and he pulled adult marvel kasai and uh i oh, was yeah. i was i was a little like man i should have grabbed my packs first because it was within <laughs> the first like five i was like i would have grabbed it and i could have gotten Heck it yeah um, man. yeah i don't i you know i'm a prism simp i like kasai a lot but i don't know if i'm gonna go for it because she's still very expensive um yeah so it's like not i might just save up for enigma and, and go into that because enigma looks really cool um i gotta i gotta do my flex i gotta get the flex in man that, that could have been you that could, that have, could been have been you you were so it could close. have been no I was, it's I, it's whatever i was just happy to be able to uh because we also we got two new players and we also grabbed like my buddy and i we each bought one of the decks that they had chosen like the blitz decks and we got them mm -hmm. each couple packs of heavy hitters so like the one guy chose kasai the other chose betsy so we we're like here's the deck and here's two packs like to get you started into the game so um that's you know, yeah it's pretty sweet to be able to do that but 
Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I feel like we've covered pretty much everything. Um, I know I said like five minutes ago we would close it out and then we kept going because that's how I am. But um, obviously, you guys should know where to find DM Armada. He is way bigger than I am on YouTube, about three times my size. So, you know, you've been here since the early days. Uh, one of the better content, probably one of the best content creators, I think, in the space. Like, you're definitely I appreciate very that. high up there, even in quality. I've noticed, I, I have to say, I've noticed that your quality has just kept improving. Um, the thing I really think you've gotten a lot better at is your ability to present information in, like, a very cohesive and, and charismatic way. Um, like you, it seems like your videos are a bit more freehand where you have like the topic. I'm, I don't know if you do like bullet points of what you want to say, but then you just like, now because when you go, you're, you've got the rare ability to just talk and actually be engaging. Cause I'm the type of person mm -hmm. where I'll repeat myself and I'll like ramble off for a little bit. So I have to structure my scripts a bit better, but I, yeah, uh, I, I definitely feel that. like, yeah, your stuff has gotten really good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's, it's definitely something that's come around a lot with a, with a lot of practice and with a lot of just doing it and when you do something three times a week for eight years or you know more uh it tends to get better over time so yeah. that I, i'm glad it's i'm glad it's uh showing that way yeah because sometimes i don't see it you know sometimes i just like i have to buckle down and, and do the next thing and and it's nice to hear that it's actually improving <laughs> because no, so. that's kind of the hope right Absolutely. So obviously, everybody go check out DM Ramon if you haven't. Go watch his video on the Blitz decks because you got a little heated in that video, just a little bit. It seemed like you you were a little annoyed at some of the, the negative opinions. Yeah, man. You know, I, I totally get discourse and I totally get that we need to uh, have, you know, conversations about things. But at the, at the end of the road, like, I don't see why we're complaining about what is Literally essentially everything. just a, a very well, what is essentially just a very cool product that isn't even fully flushed out yet. We don't know all the details about it and yet we're still kind of going on with the with the rants and the like complaints i don't know uh maybe leave room for uh for the rest of the info to come out first but uh, nevertheless yeah if, if anyone wants to go check out my rant on the uh on the topic and more explanation into my thoughts feel free to hop on the uh, old youtube channel and check it out there yeah, because be in the description. Definitely, definitely dig into it a little bit all right. Well, this has been a uh, really good talk. I really appreciate you coming on here. This has been very fun. It's always a joy to talk to you. Um, so I, I guess I guess we'll close it out here. So I hope you all have a good one, and we'll see you in the see you in the next video. Bye bye. If you like this video and wanted to support me, consider checking out my Patreon. There's extra bonuses like Talishar card sleeves, early access to videos, and even your own GigaChat card. And to those who are already supporting me, you have my undying thanks. It's because of chads like you that I can continue to do what I do. So please. Stay Chadley, my friends.